Yeah. No, I just have water, but I got one. All right. This is my special Sandra cup. Okay, ready? Here we go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hello. Hello. <laughs> I need to mute myself. One second. That's for you. Wait, no. No. There you, there you go. Yeah. Yay! There he is. Hey. How are you? How are you? Should I put on my mask too? Yes. Yeah. Hold on. Wait, wait. Oh my gosh, what a beautiful view. Yeah. What a beautiful yeah. day. Uh -oh. oh, Duncan, I love you peeking in. That's so funny. Duncan's, Duncan's peeking in. Oh, we're <laughs> I looking good in my pink and gold mask. <laughs> is this like a fashion faux pas? Is there a fashion faux pas it mixing prints? So. No. Ruben, am I allowed to mix prints? I think so. Okay. Wait, here we go. <laughs> hold on, hold on. <laughs> Can you see? <laughs> hey Ruben. How are you? Good, how are you? <laughs> oh, my husband is silly. Oh, geez. Siri, how are you? Good. Good. Cheers. Nice to meet you. How are you well, that's, with this, though? Well, that's a slight problem, though. Yeah. <laughs> We're done. Is it? Okay, can we take them off? We go like this one ear it. One ear it? Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. I have a problem because I have my glasses, too, so it's a whole thing I have to readjust. <laughs> okay, there you go. this is gorgeous. And this. Cool. And and that. There we go. Thank you very much. This one is cool because I can wear my glasses with it. Yeah, yeah. That's the whole point of these these um these peak nosed uh, masks that you can wear glasses with them. Love it. Yeah. Love it. Love it. Since we're alone, we can probably stay without the masks and actually look at each can other. We? Oh, yeah. Can we? Yeah. Thank we you. Can, you know? <laughs> <laughs> it's bad enough we have to wear them as it is. <laughs> <laughs> How are you? What's going well, on? Well, mm. lots is going on. Um, it's been quite the uh, quite the roller coaster ride the last uh, few months here in New York. Um, you know, I've had to switch my business over. You know, fashion has really taken a very um, sort of a nosedive in terms of the business, of the industry itself right now at the moment, retail especially. You know. Neiman's closing and everything else. So it's very, uh, you know, it's a difficult time for the industry. Um, and, you know, all the stores are sitting on merchandise that they got, you know, at the beginning of the year for spring. So they're not really buying anything. So it's a whole thing that everybody's trying to figure out what's going to happen next and how everybody's going to function. And so everybody's pivoting and kind of, well, not everybody, but a lot of people are pivoting and trying to figure out what, what it is they're going to do. And um, I, like many are doing the same thing. So I, um, I realized that, you know, I'm known for gowns and a lot of very sort of extravagant clothes and it just doesn't feel at all right to be doing any of that. It's, 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 it actually feels quite ridiculous to even talk about it, you know, doing ball gowns and parties and all this stuff. Um, and so, you know, it's been an interesting, interesting kind of full circle moment because I actually had a client in last week and she said, you know, I want my dress and I want it the way that it was intended to be. And it was a, such a nice kind of a refreshing kind of feeling to actually see somebody stay true to what they wanted initially without being affected emotionally or um, sort of by, by what's ought to happen by, with culture. So, you know, there's the, the musts of what we're supposed to do. Mm -hmm. And then there's the musts of what we think we should, we're supposed to do, right? The, the morality aspect of it the, the um, social aspect of it in terms of what's right, what's not right, what feels good, what doesn't feel good, what should we express, what shouldn't we express, how can we be, should we be normal, should we not be normal, I mean, all of these, you know what is normal, but all these things are sort of coming, bringing, all this stuff brings it up, and I think it's an identity crisis that I think a lot of industries, not just my own, are going to be having. Well, can we backtrack just maybe three steps? Of course, we can backtrack <laughs> three five. Um, you were, you say that a lot of designers, you know, are, there's a lot of inventory, blah, blah, blah. You were, 
you had just prepared and sold your first line to be sold at Saks Fifth Avenue, correct? No, no, it, it wasn't my first. I, I was sold at Saks many times over. But this was a whole collection. But, I, but no, I, I did the whole collection every, I, I, they bought my collection every time. It's just, they, uh, well, yeah, I guess you're right. They, it's, it's a mix between the right. two. <laughs> so they, um, <clears throat> they wanted to do a capsule collection that was specifically geared towards Saks, which was that, that was, was the first time. Yeah, and I've been carried with them for, for quite some time. So yeah, you're right, Sandra, sorry to, to, yeah, to it's okay. that here. But yeah, they, they basically wanted, asked me to do all of this sort of custom work and develop all this stuff, and I did, and it was like a seven month process, and we were supposed to launch in the fall, and well, guess what? We're not launching in the fall. <laughs> so yeah. it's, oh. uh, it's, you know, it is what it is. Yeah, 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 yeah. And you, you have had a very interesting few months. You and I have had a discussion about this and that the pandemic really hit you hard. Well, yeah, I, um, I ended up losing my like, right hand. Um, literally, this woman was my office manager and my assistant for uh, over 10 years. And she knew everything that had happened with me professionally, personally, and in many ways, I had a very, um, I guess she was like a maternal figure to me in many ways because she took care of me. You know, my mom died when I was 18 and, and Indra was always kind of watching over me, making sure that I was okay. Um, and now she's gone. And it's a very difficult thing for me to deal with. And everyone in your shop, you said too, you said, you had a cutter, one of your cutters got it. Yeah. If you had it. Well, well, we all, I think we all had it already. Um, in January, uh, one of my employees, um, her father had gone to Wuhan and they hadn't told us, she hadn't told us, but um, in oh. December, we started to get sick. And we, um, and I mean, it was like the front of house, which was the sales director, myself and Indra, and then all of our working staff, like the sewing, the sewing team and, and the cutting team. And <clears throat> literally everybody back there got sick. It was like a, it was like a, uh, a, a typhoid infirmary back there. It was unbelievable. And so everybody was sick for like five weeks, pretty much. And at one point I remember talking to Indra being like, I, 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 is everybody like, do I even have a company? Like, where is everyone? There was not a 12 people that worked with for me, um, nine were out. So, and it was for five weeks and they were all coughing and it was, uh, it was like a tuberculosis uh, uh, clinic back there. It was terrible. Yeah. Everybody was really, and, the, and everybody kept saying, this is like the worst flu I've ever had. I don't know what's going on. And they had this very shallow cough and like a low grade fever and they were just miserable for like five weeks. And, and you're in New York. Just to let everyone know. Yeah, in New York, yeah. yeah. And, so, you, and you lost her. You lost her to COVID. Yeah, well, I mean, complicated. Yeah, I mean, she didn't. You don't, we don't really know. There's no, it's not an official thing. So uh, her husband had passed away a um, week before from a heart attack. And then a week later, she came down with pneumonia and died three days later after being in the hospital. So. Oh, yeah. And left behind kids. Yeah, I left behind kids, and um, she wasn't. She was 40, 44 years old. I know. So, Can you uh, imagine, Carrie, younger than both of us? I yeah. am so so sorry. I'm so sorry. Yeah. So it's uh, it's one of these things that, and out of everyone that I have working for me, it's like the person that uh, has been with me the longest, has been the most loyal and the most true, and so. It's been very, very hard for me to like cope with the fact that this person is no longer. So it's been very, very challenging. Absolutely. God, that must feel like you just lost your arm, like you just lost a body part. Yeah, of course. I mean, I don't even know. I, like, it's very hard. I mean, I, now I have to run the business in ways that I never knew before, and I have to backtrack and do a lot of discovery. And, you know, I haven't had to do any of these things for over 10 years. You know, I'm like, I mean, I can do them, but it's very, very challenging. You know? Yeah. Oh my God. I, a lot of the stuff I must say I hate doing too. So, <laughs> well, listen, we're all doing things right now that that uh, are unknown to us. I mean, Carrie here, yeah. we're both opera singers. Right. <laughs> Carrie has learned how to edit videos. I mean, I just studied Final Cut Pro. What the hell is that? <laughs> and why 
the hell am I learning this? I'm an opera singer. I don't need to be learning software. This is crazy as hell. Sorry. <laughs> um, listen, we all pivoted I, in your business, even before the pandemic was starting to really pivot and change. And a lot of big designers were going out of business. Yeah, yeah, no, I mean, I felt that this was uh, coming for quite some time. So that's why I'm not, not really surprised or um, uh, I was prepared for it in a way psychologically. And, and I had started kind of changing a lot of the direction of what I was doing to begin with. Um, I, over a year ago, I was already like really pushing for it. So it's one of these things that if it wasn't this, it would be something else that would really shake up the industry and kind of change it. But this yeah. is what the this is what the, these are the cards we were dealt, and now we're dealing with it. So, so in what way has your line pivoted? Can you talk? Are you are you allowed to talk about that, or are you um, that under wraps? I, I can talk about it. A little, yeah, sure. Um, so, I really felt that um, there was a big divergence happening between um, what was going on with my experiences with my clients and then what the stores were doing, mm -hmm. very different things. Um, everything that the stores, everything that the clients didn't want, the stores were, were buying and vice versa. And so it just felt like there was such a disconnect um, that I really felt like I, I, I somehow got pigeonholed into being like a gown, a gown guy, like a gown designer. So, um, and I love making evening wear, but it wasn't the only thing that I ever wanted to do. And so the, the shift that it was starting to happen at the, with the big retailers and how they were buying and how they were um, changing their whole kind of matrix mm -hmm. of their selections, were, they were going for much cheaper, much more mass, much more. And evening wear to me is not something that, for, at least for the clients that I'm used to working with, is not something that's mass. There's other things that are mass, but the evening to me is not a mass product. So, um, and, I, and I would never necessarily think of uh, it as a mass product the way that they were proposing I do, if that makes any sense. Yeah. So, um, I kind of knew that I was going to start stepping out of that whole world and stepping much more into my private clients, my bridal, doing all the things that were kind of more um, inherent to having the relationships with the customers. Because with the advent of uh, you know shopping online and how people are much more accessible, there's a huge change that's happened with uh, the way that people think about shopping for designers and shopping for clothes in general. Uh, people come to me directly, whether it's through Instagram or whatever. And so there's a lot of change happening and the stores were not really with it uh, for me so um and my clients really didn't want my, my clients don't live in gowns <laughs> right well, they don't right yeah. so you know, how many gowns can you wear in a year and i was bored with it it was it just got to be a little too much so i started doing a ready-to-wear collection like i always done prior to i don't know six years ago where i really shifted into the focus of what the evening wear aspect of it and you know i have to tell you um it was so exciting for me to do like full collections again. I really, really, really enjoyed it. And so I brought, I changed the price point. It wasn't as expensive. Um, it was much more accessible uh, in terms of uh, the cost. Because there's a lot of good clothes out there for not, for a lot, not very much money. So what, what, when you talk, what kind of price range are we, are we looking at? Um, we're talking about like dresses from like 500 to 1500. Um, talking about like separates from, 200 to 300 to 400, the stuff like that. Um, I mean, before my gowns were upwards of $5,000 to $15,000. So it's like a big, uh, it's a big, big difference um, yeah. in that respect. It's still expensive. It's not, you know, it's a uh, it's bridge price point. So uh, that started to kind of take off. And then we launched it for, it was supposed to ship to stores uh, now. And so we launched it for for, for, for pre-fall 20. Oh, and, uh, and it was so beautiful. I was there when you were designing all of it. Oh, and so where, where is it right now? What happens to it? Um, there's some stores that decided to take it anyway. So we're going to be um, producing it now and shipping it out to, to stores now. Good. Okay, so very important question. Yeah. Would any of that fit my size 12 booty? Yes, of course. We're gonna have it's it's not it's not it's not specifically um, geared towards uh, towards small sizes at all. It's actually geared towards larger sizes. Really? 
Well, I mean, yeah, it's, it's what most people are, and, you know, are not every, very few people are twos, let's just put it this way. Can we uh, talk about the online stuff? Oh, sorry, Kim. No, wait, I think my thigh is a size two. <laughs> oh. oh, sorry, I, I want to know what you're drinking, though. Is that an, uh, an Aperol Spritz? Yes, it is. It's my favorite drink in the summer. It's really great. I almost had that, but then I thought, no, I had to have a little vodka shot for Ruben because wow. the last time I saw you, we had vodka shots in New York. Many, many, many many. Okay. So what about designer leisure wear? Because isn't that going to be the big market now with post-COVID? I, I, I hope that people are going to want to get out of their sweatpants. I have to hope. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that all this is gonna bring uh, people to do like for me like when I go to work now it's like I get like I get dressed up but it's kind of scary actually now in New York to be walking around like you know looking a certain way so I stopped doing it but um yeah it's very exciting it's very exciting to actually be able to put on like adult clothes and leave the house let me tell you I went upstairs and I looked at my gowns that you made yesterday and I just looked at them longingly going when am I gonna wear those again? <laughs> yeah, I had, I had a client that insisted that she want her when she wants her gown that she never received because of the COVID and everything. And I said, Well, what are you gonna be doing with it? She goes, I'm gonna wear it around the house. Carrie and I we're gonna do a show where we wear gowns. Yeah. Because you know what? We miss it. We just miss getting dressed. Dressed yeah. up. I, I got dressed up for you today. You know, I didn't Great. I didn't know what to then I'd, so, lo I'd love to talk about how you got all entangled with opera crazy singer people. Besides uh, your last name being sing singer. Yeah. I, um, so, I guess it was like nine years ago or 10 years ago or seven years ago. I don't remember how many years ago. It was a while ago. Um, I decided that I wanted to get into the opera world because um, I love opera. And... For me, it was, it's always been the highest uh, expression of high art uh, in terms of any of the performing arts. Uh, it's so epic and dramatic and over the top, and it's exactly how I like my <laughs> friends to be. And so, <laughs> not, that, um, not that you are any of those, right? <laughs> yeah, 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 no, I just, and I was fascinated with the whole grandeur of the, of, of, of the, of just the premise of what opera really represents. And so, uh, a friend, a very good friend of mine, actually, is an agent in London for opera singers. And I said to him, I said, Joel, can you um, hook me up with somebody? Because I, I'd like to start penetrating this world. And he said, well, he said why? <laughs> 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 and I said, because I want to. And he said, okay, of course. And so he actually introduced me to um, Aileen Perez. And she was the first opera singer that I, that I, um, that I worked with. And she... Uh, she was wonderful, and um, this was, yeah, this was like seven or eight years ago. She was just really starting, like, to really come into her own, and uh, so Aileen was the first, and then one after another after another, it kind of became, because my clothes are very um, noticeable, and so even at the, I think it was the Tucker found, what is it? It was, yeah, it was the Tucker Gala. Tucker Gala, yeah, and so everybody kind of took notice of her, uh, you know, in those dresses, and were asking about it, and so, one thing led to another, you know, it was like a chain effect sort of uh, kind of going along. And I had the idea in my mind to really um, conquer this, the, first by, by working with the divas and the singers, uh, and then eventually getting much more, much further into the whole, into the whole process of the actual art of opera. But I knew it would be a long road, road to kind of uh, walk because, um, it's a world that's very specific. Mm -hmm. It's a world that has a lot of um, preconceived notions of what it ought to be. It's very difficult to change things. Mm. It's very difficult to evolve into something that's different. However, at the same time, it's also very open to newness because not everybody is like going after it, right? So there's a mm -hmm. there's an right. there's an inherent um, uh, openness to 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 the to, to what I was doing, which was kind of a contradiction in terms, but that's just how it felt and seemed, and it actually ended up being that way. Um, but, you know, I remember last year, um, and I, of course, I dressed on in the trap girl, and then, uh, 
all these Renee different Fleming, people. Renee Fleming, a lot. What? Renee What's Fleming. It? Renee Fleming. I don't even remember everybody. Yeah. Um, uh, um, that other soprano, Sandra something or other. Yeah, her. <laughs> yeah, something or other. Uh huh. Yeah. 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 Uh, it was horrible. She was so bad. She yeah. was so bad. <laughs> <laughs> and I remember Anna was being honored uh, at um, Cipriani, and she, I made her outfit for her, and she said, "Would you, you should come." And I said, "Okay, of course, I would love to." And it was a luncheon that was being hosted, um, and uh, there's all these greats of like the opera world there, and I, I took my mentor uh, Richard with me, and. Uh, my, the man that basically I gave my first job at Oscar Duranta and uh, we went together because he loves opera as well and um, I was sitting there and they're calling up all these amazing pillars of, of the opera world and I was like yeah. so excited to be there and the last person that they called was me and they called me up on stage yeah it was such a I was like I couldn't believe it because I was sitting in the back I was like just enjoying it and they called me up stage because she insisted that I actually be um, recognized as the person did a lot of clothes for her and dressed her in person and whatever. And it was such a, I actually felt quite uncomfortable on stage, which I never really do. I don't feel uncomfortable in a lot of situations, but there I felt like, oh, I think I didn't belong on. Like it was all these amazing people and that they had, you know, earned their right under the sun in terms of what they had done with opera. And this was just, I was just dressing, you know, these women. And it really just dressing. Your gowns, I have to tell you, the structure of the gowns that you make you make every woman look phenomenal. And I, I feel so great when I wear your gowns, honestly. Thank they you. are built beautifully. And all the women at the Chicago Lyric of the three queens gowns that you made, they all came up to me, all the Polish seamstresses, and they said, I have never seen gowns made so well. Yeah, thank you. Well, Definitely. I will have to say, like, I, I did my research. And what you've accomplished from even just 2007 until now is, is you had every right to be on that stage with all those people. So don't say that. <laughs> I mean, I felt, I mean, I, don't get me wrong. I loved every second of it, but at the same time, I felt a little uncomfortable because they didn't feel like I belonged. And, and to some extent, they didn't, you know? Ruben, come on. I mean, you designed Beyonce's gowns for the halftime show, yeah. right? In 2000. Yeah. How many people can say that? <laughs> no, no, actually, nobody can say that. Right. My so, yeah, right there. bingo. I mean, how how does that how does that come up? Okay, so for people out there that don't know this, you designed. We came up with this concept of this concert that was the last act of the Three Queens, and we have a mutual friend that said, "Hey, let's have Ruben make these dresses," with no thought in mind. She just said, "Here you go, Ruben." Now create a gown for Anne Boleyn, Mary Stuart, and Queen Elizabeth I, and go. How did that happen? I mean, how did you go from point A to point Z? You know, like. Wow, there was a lot of letters in between those points. Mm -hmm. but, um, <laughs> a lot. But um, to get, I mean, that was like the beginning of what the point, the goal of what I had started was really. I mean, it was like the, for me, a culmination of, a, of a, a basically a self-manifested idea that I had whittled in my brain uh, almost a decade prior coming to, coming into reality. And there it was, and there it was happening. Um, I had a question as far as in, along the lines with Sandra. So, because what you do, I what I think what you do is art, and so when you are when you're thinking about Sandra, or you're thinking about this character, or where does that? I mean, is Sandra who Sandra is as a person and as a performer? Does that come into it? I mean, how does that manifest itself into into the yeah. costume that you made? Like yeah. even green dress the green dress alone how did that manifest from your imagination into yeah. including did it include sandra or was it just of course. okay of course carrie worded it much better thank you what carrie worded it much better thank you yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. she did actually yes well, i mean I, i've always been so impressed with the <laughs> Nothing you tell. Um, I was always just so impressed with when i see the sketches of something especially for a brand new production 
but then how does that sketch manifest into has that person researched? Because I've done this before where no one researched who I was or what I looked what? like. Whatever. What? Whatever. And then, I, Sandra? And then right. I show up, I show up and I'm like, uh, did you look at a picture? Yeah. Did you see that I have boobs? I got big old boobies. So that's not going to work. <laughs> so I just was wondering, yeah, for your process, how did that all? Well, first of all, the three characters that I was doing were quite iconic, uh, legendary, historic figures. So I was already given something that was already very packed with preconceived visual, psychological, and historical notion, right? Mm -hmm. So there's that ball of yarn to unravel. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the things that Sandra and I spoke about when we started this whole thing was that it wasn't going to be costumes, costumes. Uh, the Met did like costumes, period costumes for all three of them, and it, they were phenomenal. Mm -hmm. uh, nobody needs that from me. Mm -hmm. However, for me, it's very, authenticity is very important, and truth is very important in, in the work and the craft. And when it's, for me, when it's not truthful, it doesn't work, that people sense it that there's a falseness to it, that there's a, something off, uh, mainly that it's just bullshit. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's the same in singing. I mean, if somebody's mm -hmm. not really in the emotions and really meaning it, and I mean, yeah. you know, immediately. Yeah, yeah. Awesome. Ding, 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 ding. Yeah. Like yeah, it. you smell it. Yeah, you suddenly feel it, you taste it. It's all, it's just the falseness is just there. Yeah. So, I, knew about the Tudor Queens. I had studied them in, in, in school, but I needed to really refresh my memory and really get into them. And the first one that I was doing, of course, was the, the great whore, Anne Boleyn. And <laughs> when Sandra and I sat down to talk, I kind of listened to her and needed to get her feedback and her input on what mm -hmm. her impression of what it should be from her mouth her, her mind, and she gave it to me, and we kind of were on the same page. We were on the same page. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, abstract, in the abstract terms. Mm -hmm. um, and so then I set off to do it, and I think it was eight, how long was the whole process? Like 18 months? Oh, yeah. Yeah, probably, because it was my, it was my 50th birthday present from this person that, that, said here you go i'm going to help you and introduce you to ruben and yeah i would say 18 months for sure and so it wasn't it was going to be fashion it wasn't going to be costume necessarily we wanted it to look modern in some way but it's at the same time your identity and your your stamp yeah, yeah 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 well and the thing is that i don't know how to do anyone else but me if i'm doing a dress it's always going to be mine because you know, oh do you feel like you're copying somebody if i asked you to do like a mini skirt or like a pant like, no because i don't know how to do anybody else it doesn't i don't i don't reference anything i don't reference any of my contemporaries i don't it just comes from me there's a there's an internal thing that happens and it just bleh, and there, it's, there it is so um Sandra and I met, and then I was off on my own kind of conceptualizing all this. And so I started to work on the sketches. And Bolin was the, really the first and I thought that was the hardest at first because it was the first one I was doing. But then as I, I went to each one, then that became the hardest. And then, of course... But I think the last one was the yeah, hardest. Yeah, and then Elizabeth, of course, the first, which was the real clincher, um, naturally. Uh, but we'll get to her later. Um, so, yeah, so Anne Boleyn. She was all very, very, very plain looking too. She's quite a bore visually. Um, nice, but boring. Yeah. So what do, what do you have there? You got some pearls and you got like a square neckline, you know? I mean, there's, there's yeah. not much. And the, and, the, and the hat thing, yeah. So I made the dress, I did the sketches, we approved the sketches, we had a few meetings in between. And then I had done the dress according to what we had talked about. And I picked really beautiful fabrics, I must say. The fabrics were gorgeous, and, and, the, and Sandra loved them. And we went through everything. And it was just fucking boring. I don't know. It just didn't have the fire that I really wanted this thing to have. Because at the end of the day, she was a very fiery individual. I mean, she really caused a lot of, you know, 
a lot of stuff happened with her mm -hmm. in her life and with her. So it was very much about figuring out how I was going to throw in the, the fire and the passion of that and the, and the monument of explosive emotion, right, that he would feel through her. And so I was flying home from Los Angeles, San Francisco. And I was on the plane. And I was thinking about how, uh, I was also thinking about Mary Stewart and her. And then I was like thinking about how she was, like, her head was cut off. Her head was cut off. I was like, oh my God, she needs to have her head cut off. She needs to have her head cut off. I need to cut her head off right now. So, I, I literally came back from there and I ran to the studio. And I started cooking um, these things, like different like fibers that I would find and paint. And I actually ended up getting some ketchup and tomato sauce and all this crazy stuff, like with the hairballs off the floor, like everything I could find. And I was, <laughs> Wait, my dress had hairballs off the floor. <laughs> yeah, the dust bunnies, yeah. Um, I threw everything that I could find, any kind of fiber that was really strange and sort of like tactile. And I cooked it up in this kind of like soup. Um, and I, and it was like heavy because I had like threads in there and yarns and all this kind of stuff. And I kind of took it and the dress was like immaculate. It looked amazing. And then I just took it and I started throwing this shit at it. Can you believe this, Gary? You pollocked it. That, you know, yeah. the <laughs> Yeah. And it was amazing. It was amazing. And it's exactly what that dress needed. And I cut off her head that night. It looked like blood. It yeah. looked like blood flowing. Yeah, it was like ox, ox, like dark, old, like dark, like sort of congealed, sort of dried blood. It was really cool. Yeah. Awesome. That's Mary Stewart came quickly, though. She was. Mary Stewart? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, she was, she was easy in, in a sense. Yeah, yeah she, she, her was, hers was all about being the sort of like powerful, dominant one, the real, the, the, the true queen out of the two, uh, two, individuals, two cousins, um, Mary, uh, Mary and, uh, and Elizabeth. Mm -hmm. And uh, green was the color of, of, of power, really. And so I felt right for her to be in green. Um, and I took one of the most important things for me at this point was with the two of them were the collars. Mm -hmm. And I knew that I, what in my skill set I couldn't necessarily achieve the kind of collars that I needed that I had in my head, and I reached out to somebody uh, to, to this um, really talented, also designer. He does all of these accessories and, and visual sort of um, elements for uh, a lot of performers like Lady Gaga and so on. And so I'd worked with him in the past, Neo, and. Uh, I went on his site and I saw exactly what it is that I was looking for. He did these 3D printed sort of like Elizabethan sort of collars that were like all kind of weird and edgy and made out of like plastics and resins. It was exactly what I was like feeling. So, yeah. yeah. And so I, um, I called him and we met and then I introduced him to Sandra and everything was like, good to go and we decided to move forward with him and so after with Mary instead of putting the collar around her neck I decided to put it on her shoulders mm -hmm. yeah like so they went this way yeah and talking about like you know you have to work with every I'm dressing Sandra here right right so, and she's singing right as yeah. much as I want to do like this you can't I can't yeah. you tried <laughs> <laughs> He tried and I was like, Ruben, I gotta sing. Yeah. But Elizabeth was the one that really busted your balls. Yeah, Elizabeth was crazy. Um, because she's so iconic. And I really, 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 really wanted to make something that was new. But still be so true to who she was and the visual because you can't, it's so iconic that yeah. you can't separate yourself from it. Otherwise it's not her. Mm -hmm. Like, why do her unless you're going to really uh, exude her essence? Like, what was I going to fucking do with to make this very powerful, really defining monarch of, the, of, the, of, of all time, really? I mean, she was the first kind of queen of her, of her sort. 
that really made the monarchy on, the, on that level, uh, visually especially, I'm um, not even talking about all the things that she had done, but she was so visually uh, uh, um, impactful and strong and specific. Like you can't really go away from that, but at the same time, you don't want to do what's already been done. Mm -hmm. And so I was going through this mental, like, you know, oh. yeah, it was tough. Oh. It was really, really tough. But then like, I was like, okay, well, you know, this is the end of her life, right? The Dunzanetti opera is based on the end of her life when she finds out about, you know, Roberto Devereaux, her lover, that he was killed by her own hand, essentially. And how that whole breakdown happens and how she was really a human. She really was a woman with vulnerabilities and with strength. And um, she, uh, I really needed to show both of those things. And it was at the end of her life when she was coming, kind of coming and done. And so I decided I was going to show the interior of her clothes as the exterior. So my whole thing was, is I wanted, and, and because she's dying, it was already like an apparition, right? She was already a ghost almost. She was on her way. She killed her. In the way that she died, it's like, you know, not eating or drinking for however many days. I mean, the whole thing is just so like massively iconic and epic. And it's operatic. Operatic, yes. <laughs> um, that I really wanted to give that essence. And so I took the, what, the construction of the interior of those clothes, the cages and all of the insides, mm -hmm. and I really wanted to make them the outside. And I said to Sandra when, when I was designing it, I said, it's very important from the beginning that you have light coming through the back of you so that you see through the costume. Because I really wanted to give the essence of her being naked but clothed. Yeah. Exposed but, but covered. And I also wanted to show the strength of what was around her, like the structure of those clothes, because that, they were like a skeleton. They protected the, 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 the organs. And stuff. So cool. Yeah. yeah. And so... It was, and, and I could create, I wanted to create all of the shapes that she had, but make them all transparent. And so. <laughs> you get it. It's super cool. Yeah. It's the one that everyone remembers and talks about. It yeah. really is. Well, I don't know. I, I don't know. I, it would be hard to pick like my fave because each one was its own specific story and its own specific thing. Yeah. And the Maria Stu uh, Stuart or the Maria Stuart uh, costume, the green, like that green to me meant envy because she was so envious of oh, Queen Elizabeth. Of there was, you know, that color was just so perfect to me. Like when I, when oh, I, I like it. yeah, it was. I don't know. I don't know if I could pick a fake. Oh Lord, that'd be so hard. Okay. Well, the thing is, is that, that Elizabeth is so over the top in general that yeah. she kind of wins just because yeah. of the complexity of it. Yeah, um, the story, and she's Elizabeth the first, and everyone else is like, you know. Yeah, and of the three, the three last scenes, that's really the most dramatic and vocally dramatic, and all that. But really, I'm very curious. All three, yeah. Of uh, Anna, I mean Anna, Anna got yeah. the key to separate from the church. I mean, that is like the hugest thing any female probably could have ever done during that time. Well, any, the craziest thing that any female could have ever done is being queen at the end of the yeah, day. Yeah, that's true. You know? <laughs> well, it was fun and, and hopefully it happens again. That yeah, we get it will. Again and it will. I know. And, uh, the, the most, the most, actually the most, um, the most important thing of the whole thing with Elizabeth for Sandra was for me to create that neck piece, oh, but to do it in a way that was totally different, right? So Amir and I kind of sat there and I, I said, I want it to be transparent. I want all of those ruffles to exist. I want them to be transparent and they can't be on her neck, right? So it was all about like how I was going to create the essence of Elizabeth, but still give Sandra the ability to sing and look modern. Yeah. You know? And uh, one of the most amazing parts was something that happened at the very end, and that was a kind of Sandra's input when she was get when she was dying. They decided to actually derobe her, and all the sleeves were all in different parts. And so they took it all apart on stage, and and it was so amazing and so brilliant way to show you know the passing of a soul. It was an amazing moment. Yeah. And by the way, they're making it into a CD. Amazing. Okay. Not a DVD, unfortunately, but a CD, so.
to talk to us. That we talked about your your designs and where you are now. I mean, first off, we need to say that people can buy these amazing masks. Well, oh, please tell me where because my mom, I need to order them for a lot of people. So they're going to be available on Instagram, I think, this week, and we're going to have them online by the end of the week. So uh, by Wednesday or Thursday, they're going to be on my yeah. So um, the, the Heavens Ruben Singer, um, but yeah, we'll Look at that. I'll, we'll let you know. We will. We'll, I'll let you know for sure. Where okay. They're. Oh, Thank oh you. I would like to know exactly the time so that I make sure that I get mine before everybody else gets theirs. <laughs> they are amazing. And you are now dealing with a new kind of fabric? Um, Possibly? Can not, we talk about that? I'm, I'm, I myself am not dealing with a new kind of fabric. But um, a new fabric is being developed. It's actually been developed by this Israeli scientist where they uh, have created a fabric that is, uh, is this what you're talking about, Sandra? Yeah, is, um, the, they created a fabric. I wish I would have invented this, but I would have been a really rich man right now, very quickly. But they created a fabric that basically is like an old school, um, uh, Middle Eastern cotton that is infused with copper and a few other elements. Uh, chemical treatments and whatnot, that the fabric is completely antibacterial, antiviral. So nothing can penetrate it. Everything dies and comes in contact with it. Any bacteria, microbial, anything. And it can be washed for the rest of, for, for all, all time. I know, isn't that amazing? Yeah. And you're gonna, are you thinking of designing in this fabric? Or? Well, no, I don't even think I have access to this fabric. I don't think a lot of people will for a long time because it's, um, all governments now, uh, I think Hong Kong is the first uh, government to actually start using it. They're going to start replacing it, the MND5s with this fabric. Wow. So it's a really big deal. Um, very, very cool. And you know, I met with, uh, I'm on this really amazing uh, board, of this thing called Retailers United. And uh, when COVID started to really take a hold, this group of people that are like all different, really bright uh, minds of, of of retail and fashion kind of came together and decided, well, what are we going to do in order to help PPE and uh, all the frontline workers and whatnot? And how are we going to uh, um, engage the retail world in order for them to also participate in this so that they're not left behind as well? And so over the last two months, we've been meeting quite a bit and they have been really, really an incredible group of people that have been so supportive of me and uh, of, of so many other people as well. But they had one of these, uh, the number one expert in the world on masks come and speak to us uh, as, a, as a group. And he explained to us, I mean, this guy is literally considered the one and only expert on uh, protective, protective masks. And he explained to us how it all works. And essentially, um, you know, there's really not, there's nothing that can protect you fully from anything. That's number one. Mm -hmm. Number two, uh, N95, uh, N K95 uh, masks are um, used for, are sterile, and they're used for um, operation, for doctors for surgery. So when you see packages of 10 or whatever, that means it's not the, the, the authentic mask because it's not sterile then. It's taken out of the packaging. So just for you to know what, what, what's what. And then ultimately, there's three kinds of masks. There's the kind that the construction workers wear with the dust. That actually is the only mask that really protects you, the individual okay. uh, that's wearing it. Um, the masks that uh, I make are really a protective towards everyone else. It's really a matter of protecting, uh, it's keeping your hygiene to yourself. Uh, not about, uh, I, I still believe it protects you somewhat, but officially what they say is that it protects only the, um, the, you from everyone else, basically. Okay. So it's a very um, interesting uh, idea that we're now all wearing something that's more beneficial to others than it is to us. Right. It's it's kind of the only way that this is going to be controlled ultimately, and um, and it's really what I've been doing is I've been tr trying to figure out ways in which that um, in ways in which people can feel comfortable and look good and not look like these gross with these blue masks that are just everybody's tired of it, look like diapers on your face. Yeah. And, uh, 
I like this one because mm -hmm. I wear glasses. And this one, I'll just get them here. My favorite color. There we go. They don't fog up. I think it's super cool. Yeah, that's what, one of the things that was making me crazy is that I would not, uh, I also wear glasses, obviously. Yes. And, um, I would have, a, I, it makes you crazy when you wear glasses and you're, you're, you're wearing these stupid masks and like your eyes, you can't see, you can't breathe, you can't do anything. They fall up. I like them. I don't know if yours is going to work because you don't have the, 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 the high the peak. peak. You don't have the peak, yeah. Does it fog? It must. Yeah, they just fogged. <laughs> yeah, oh, there they are. Yeah. Totally you have the bigger fun. one. You need this one, which is super cool, by the way. Oh my God. No, I saw that and I was like, when can I buy that? <laughs> I'm sorry, I didn't know you, so I didn't know what you could possibly, I didn't know. Okay, but how did you know? I mean, like, pink is my favorite color and it had gold and I was like, did you look at a video of me online? Well, I did look at a video. Ruben does just, his homework. Uh, yeah, I'm not like those other, you know, people that you were mentioning before that don't, uh, that don't uh, yes. mention and do their research. That's not me. Now, can I ask you something? Sure. Now that we've talked about what you do. Yeah. What about, okay, your life should be a soap opera. Yes. Your family history yes. is spectacularly amazing. And how you chose to continue in this business, even with your grandfather, your father, is really a huge testimony to you. Thank you. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, it's tough to talk a little bit about it because it's yeah, I know. Hard, but yeah, um, I will try and condense it. So basically, I'm third generation of Russian fashion designers. My grandfather, who I'm named after, uh, uh, was working in Poland uh, at the time when the Nazis invaded Warsaw. Um, he had a very successful business both in Poland and in France. Sorry, wind over here. Um, uh, I've been born in France, and essentially, um, when the Nazis came, he had 12 brothers and sisters who he worked with, who worked with him. All of them were killed, except for him and his brother. Oh. And they made under the um, firing squad of dead bodies for 13 hours of their siblings, uh, pretending to be dead, only to get up and start walking by foot into Russia. And they walked by foot into Russia. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Well, thank you. I mean, this story needs to be told. It is too unbelievable almost to be real. Yeah, so we, um, this we, they uh, walked by foot um, uh, to, so into the Soviet Union and then they were, uh, they got away from the Nazis, but then they were captured by the communists. Um, and then my grandfather was put to mine for coal. And he said, I'm not doing this. Uh, I make clothes. Um, and the commanding officer said, okay, you think you can make clothes? He goes, here's some fabric, a needle, a thread, and some scissors. Make me a suit and I'll decide whether I keep you or I kill you. Oh. You have two days. So he made him a suit in two days. And then he was asked to do it again and again and again. And then on the seventh or eighth time, he was hooded and taken somewhere. He arrived in Moscow. Well, he later found out he arrived in Moscow. And uh, he was put in front of Joseph Stalin to do the same thing. And he did it. And uh, Stalin officiated him as the chief designer, the first design, the first couture of the Communist Party. It's, it's, it's an oxymoron, but that's basically what happened. So here was this Polish Jew that became the most celebrated uh, clothing maker and designer of the Soviet elite. And so my dad started studying under him when he was 13, when his mother died. And um, all of the seamstresses and the sewers that Ruben had in his um, uh, atelier were all of the people that sewed all the, cal all the cavalry and all the clothes for the Tsar and Tsarina. So these were the people that were still like, you know, made all of the clothes from the Decembrists and all the royalty. And that's who taught my father how to sew and how to cut and how to make clothing, uh, along with my grandfather. And my father's first job uh, was doing the costumes for the horses and elephants of the Moscow Circus. Mm -hmm. 
So he always says, no matter who it is, we can always make them fit. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I do. So many things come to mind. Yeah. <laughs> so we, um, so my dad uh, started dressing all the animals in the circus, and uh, he then became, uh, he started working with the um, Igor Stanislavski, and he became the director of the of costumes from the Stanislavski Theater, and then um, did the costumes from Bolshoi and had a lot of clients, and he was kind of taking over for Ruben. And Ruben was supposed to come back to, um, wanted to come back to the West, his, his whole time in the Soviet Union. First time, uh, and he was allowed out because he was so connected. Um, first time was uh, in the late 40s, uh, all these things went on the ship, he didn't get on, nobody knows why. And the second time, uh, he, Finally got to Europe, he got back to, to not to Europe, to, to Italy. Um, and he arrived in Florence and two days later, on July 22nd, 1968, he dies in a car accident. So uh, he died in the West where he wanted to, but you know, he wasn't there very long, unfortunately. Fast forward, my dad, very successful, also kind of took over Ruben's position. And uh, in the 70s, there was an exchange happening between the uh, Russians and the um, and the French, and they were having a culture exchange, which is how Nureyev defected and all these other artists. They were having this cross pollination of different artistic uh, um, fields, uh, going and working in, in one another's countries. And my father was invited to come work in Paris and do a couture for a year, so he was allowed to leave. And there was this girl that needed to get out and meet her fiance in Italy, and so they, there was an arranged marriage that was made on the phone. This girl was supposed to pay my father six thousand dollars to get her out of the country, and well, um, my mom owed my father that money her whole life, <laughs> and they got she got pregnant, and they were supposed to leave together, and they fell in love, and uh, they they left um, so they left Moscow, the Soviet Union, with everything behind, and they were both very well off. They left everything behind with almost nothing, um, and they flew to Austria. And my mother was eight months pregnant not knowing what was gonna happen, what, what was going on. And so um, when they arrived in Austria on July 22nd, 1978, the same day that Ruben died, I was born 10 years to the day. Carrie, I'm telling you, doesn't this need to be a movie? Yeah, I'm thinking like which actors are gonna play what? Like, <laughs> no. And, and it, despite all of that, you decided to continue in in this business yeah no and, and I, I feel like there's a karmic uh there's a karmic cycle that needs to be completed here yeah uh, and that's kind of you know i lost my mother very young and uh, uh i'm very close with my father he still works with me and uh i feel like there's this cycle that needs to be kind of completed and that's mm -hmm. my purpose now i did read though that your dad said don't go into this business like please be a lawyer or something. Yes, an international lawyer. That's what all my parents wanted me to do. They were grooming me my whole life because I speak three languages. They were like, yes, you're going to do it. Yeah. A lawyer. And nope. No. I wish I was a ballerina. I, was, I went into ballet, which, I mean, I don't know what's worse. And then I got into fashion. So I decided at least, that, at least I have more longevity in fashion. I didn't want my career to be over 30, and, you know. And with a broken body, so. And you, so is your, oh, sorry. So is your dad happy now that you did what you did, that you chose what you chose? I couldn't say that he's happy about it. I mean, he's definitely supportive and he's given, he, at, what, at this point, I'm, you know, I'm 40, like 41. It's time that he get, comes to terms with the fact that this is my craft, <laughs> my career, and this is what I yeah. do. He's um, proud of you. Yeah, he is proud right. of you. When he saw those three queen's gowns. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. yeah, yeah, he's very proud. It's just, uh, I'm sure he still wishes I was doing something else. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. Don't all of our parents, though? I mean, how many times? My mom, I think she wanted me to do something else. I don't know about you, Carrie, but. No, my mom was always like, just, uh, my mom actually just wanted me to go for what I wanted. And don't let anybody hold you back. No one, not a man, not anything. And um, my dad was like, you want to do what? And I'm like, yeah. <laughs> I want to sing opera and he's like can you make any money doing that and I said I think I can and he goes well I guess you could always come home and be a Disney princess because I'm from Florida and I was like dad <laughs> and she sings pop music really well she sings the Disney princess girl 
Did you ever do So let me ask you this because I know some designers shy away from doing plus size women. I mean, there is this huge thing in Hollywood, you know, where, oh gosh, what's her name? Leslie, uh, the comedian who couldn't find a designer to help her oh, right, yeah. for, was it the Oscars? Or I can't remember what the award show was. Yeah. But I, I mean, I love what you say about empowerment and, and a lot of us come in different sizes and feel empowered in those sizes. And so is that an issue for you? Is that something that, that, um, no, no, you can't like, work 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 anybody. no, no, no. I mean, I've, please, I've gone, I've dressed every, every kind of, no, I, I've, I've dressed, I've dressed like Mike Karaki, who's like a double zero Japanese pop star, and I've worked with Ashley Graham and Queen Latifah, so I, I it's not like, a, it's not like a thing for me, what it is, what it's much more about is um, making the woman feel right in whatever it is that she's doing. And, I, and one of the very most important things for me is that, the, the, that she feels good in the clothes themselves, that they're comfortable, that they're not, my, my clothes are co quite complex, but they're very easy to wear. Like you're not, everybody says that it's the most easiest thing I've ever worn. Well, uh, I, love, I love what I read that, um, that you actually cared about what it looked like at the end of the evening. Like what did it look like when they stood up? after sitting at an awards event or whatever, and, yeah. and they felt in it at the end, because there's sometimes we wear things, we feel great starting out, but then by the end of the night, we cannot wait to get it off our bodies, so. Yeah, no, no, it's like, I don't want my women looking drunk before they leave the house. <laughs> I don't want them, I don't want them uncomfortable before, like, when the minute they get there. All these things are like, not like what, I, what I'm about. I'm about making the whole, and I think the back of the dress sometimes is much more important than the front of the dress. Ooh. You know, seeing how you look when you leave is sometimes more important than when you what you come in looking like. That's so true. Um, uh, Ruben, it's gosh, it's not been great. And and honestly, we hope that everything comes back. Me too. Yeah. Bigger and better. Yeah, me too. Like I, and yeah. Sandra, thank you so much for this because I just love you. I wish I could hug you. Like a big hug. You He's are. a lot of, Ruben's a lot of fun, I have to say, yeah. besides being extremely brilliant and your thought process making all of your, we didn't, we didn't even get to that discussion on how you come up with collections and, and it's things that you've lived and all of that, but maybe we'll have to interview, interview you again in a couple months when. Sure, I love that. Yeah. But part two. <laughs> part, part two, Ruben, part two. But is there anything else you want to say to people right now before we do our rapid fire questions with you? Oh, I have to start having these questions. Uh, no, I'm ready to go. Are you sure? Are you, are you, no, are you I'm not sure, sure, but I'm going to go with it. I'm going to uh -oh. go with it. Okay. <laughs> we we never aim to embarrass anybody. Where's your drink? Get your drink. <laughs> I already drank it. It's almost gone. No, mine's gone too. I miss that we Russian. Drink since the beginning. Yeah, Sandra. I miss that remember. Russian restaurant with the vodka selection. That uh, was like, yeah. I think you needed a couple of those lined up. <laughs> yeah, like, yeah. Uh -huh. Maybe the whole bottle. <laughs> Okay. Okay. I'll start it. Okay. What is your favorite color and why? Yellow, because it is the color that to me is the most, has the most intensity. Uh, what's the most beloved thing that you own? A Japanese uh, geisha doll that my mother and father gave me when I was 12. Aww. Boxers or briefs? Nothing. I knew you were going to oh, say that. I knew it. Love it. Okay. <laughs> um, okay. <laughs> if you could choose any, oh my God, I, I, if I ever meet you in person, I'm totally going to blush because I know that now. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. If you could, if you could choose any magical power, what would it be? Time travel. Yeah. And what is your guilty pleasure? Oh, there's so many. Oh, I just, um, I know. That's why I had to ask that. Oh, I really, uh, Just go for one. Okay, I'll go for something peachy. Let's see here. Um. <laughs> yeah, you can, you could be slightly R. Okay. Uh, let me think here. What is my guilty pleasure? Guilty pleasure. I'm thinking of my life. I think about I know. That. He's just thinking about the best one. Uh, yeah, there's just so many. I yeah, have so many vices. Um, here. Um, I actually, my, one of my favorite guilty pleasures is um, anonymously escaping New York quietly mm -hmm. under the radar. 
So yeah. nobody knows that I'm gone. That's my favorite. I like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ruben's at work. Yeah, uh -huh. I'm at work. Yeah, Ruben's at work. Yeah, okay. I hope I can get to do it again soon. You will. It's been a long time since that. You can come up here. You can come up here and see my forest. Yeah. Come to you Nashville. Wouldn't know what to do. Come to Nashville. Go visit Carrie in Nashville. Yeah, I love Nashville actually. It's fun. Yeah. Normally I do too, but lately it's crazy. Well, nobody likes anywhere. I mean, New York is you can't imagine. Yeah. We didn't um, know about that either. Yeah. Mm. Well, I want to wear your masks all over Nashville so that people actually see how beautiful they are and they want to wear them too, because we need- Yes, that would be great. Thank you. Thank you. All right, what is, your favorite, what is your favorite curse word? Motherfucker. Yes, my favorite. Okay. Yeah, motherfucker's a good one. What is your favorite word? Divine. What? Divine. Divine. Oh. And your least favorite word? Pedestrian. You have to fill in the blank. What the world needs now is? Uh, really love? I'm not saying that. No, 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 no. That's just too uh, obvious. That's too cheesy. It's way too cheesy. I love the cheese. <laughs> yeah, but, um, Truth. Oh. Mm -hmm. Preach. Okay. And the last question, I got to take my mask off for this, sorry. <laughs> if heaven exists, yeah. what would you like God to say when you arrive at the pearly gates? You did good, kid. You did good, kid. You did do good. And you're going to do even greater, greater, greater things. I know it. Yeah, for real. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Well, no. Thanks for, for taking the time with us today. Yeah, of course. And it's good to see you. Me too. Nice to meet you. It was a pleasure, truly. Let us know about the masks and everything when, when yeah, they're yeah. this week I'll, I'll I'll finally get it up and running. Please, I'm re I have my credit card ready and ready to go. Yeah. <laughs> Say hi to your dad. Well, thanks so much, ladies. Thanks, dad, you bye. Take care. Bye. Bye. Thanks, Ruben. Bye. You're welcome. Awesome. Isn't awesome. he awesome? Yeah. I knew you were going to like Ruben. I love him. I love him. I just would want to hang out with him because of him. You know what I mean? He's a heck of a lot of fun. He's a cutie patootie. But Ruben, one, one little thing that I can say about Ruben now that he's gone, he likes things tight. I do too. I do too, but you can't go on like... Breathe, breathe from your coochie, girl. Breathe from the coochie. Oh, I was trying, but then when you do that, then the boobs just go like... <laughs> we, <Yeah, man. laughs> Ruben kept on pulling it in tight. He kept on saying me every fitting. Sandra, don't you go eat anymore because I am not altering these dresses. Like, don't hang out with Carrie Alchemo because it's going to be a problem. <laughs> no good. Oh, and then what do we do? We go, we had this night at this Russian restaurant. That's why I had this because the last time I saw him in New York. Oh. And you lucky I, girl. I'm so jealous of that. Oh, you lucky. I lucky. can't tell you how many shots of vodka we had. Oh, and then father came and joined us because they're Russian, right? That, that's his first language is Russian. Okay. Um, My head hurt so bad that next day. Oh, I bet. <laughs> I yeah. think I remember that. I think I remember you texting. I think I, I, I called you. It's before I went to New York. Uh, it's Chicago. My God, my brain is not functioning today. It's COVID brain. It's like, what the hell, man? Are COVID we done brain. yet? Are we done yet? <laughs> it's like fashion divas. Well, I feel pretty in this. I feel, I mean, if I have to wear a mask, I feel great in this. I'm like, hey, I look good. Mm. It's comfortable and it's not heavy. Yeah, it's super light. And I love that yeah. it's my ears because the ones I have right now are the ones that go over my whole head. So this is like, now I'm not messing with my hair or ruining my hair from all that elastic. So this is awesome. No, I love it. It's really comfortable. Yep. No, and I can wear my glasses with the other ones. So. I, I want those. My mama's going to want that. Everybody. I Run out, get them. Right? Yep. There you go. And they're signed by Ruben Singer. There you go. Carrie's got hers. And mine was signed inside. Ooh, that's fancy. Uh, it is fancy. I feel fancy in it. Look at that 